I'd like to very warmly welcome our next keynote speaker, Rinki Sethi, who will be delivering the keynote of the day. Most of you might already know her, actually, since she's a renowned leader in the security industry. Rinki is currently the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer of Twitter. Prior to that, she has been a leader in, in companies like IBM, Palo Alto Networks, and Rubrik, just to name a few of them, actually. Rinki serves as an advisor to several startups, including LevelOps, Authomize, Fika Ventures, again, just to name a few, actually. Rinki is also super active in cybersecurity organizations, open ones, women, ones that support diversity and women, like women in cybersecurity, women cyber jutsu. And in 2014, she was actually recognized by CSO Magazine and Alta Associates Executive Women's Forum with the One to Watch Award that honors an upcoming thought leader in the security industry. And we all know where she is today. But beyond all that, what makes Rinky unique, I think, is the fact that she serves as a mentor for many and many students and professionals despite her busy career and schedule. So um, I, I, I really am looking forward to seeing Rinky speak with us over here today with Shakti Khan. Shakti Khan is extremely honored to have you here with us today, Rinky. So welcome aboard. And to all the participants, I urge you to keep your questions ready. Uh, if you have any when Rinky is speaking, please feel free to leave them on the chat and Rinky will get back to them after the session. So over to you, Rinky. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Surya. And thanks everyone for having me. Um, you know, I thought a lot about what could I share with all of you that would be meaningful. And, um, you know, I've done so many presentations and I was thinking first, maybe I'll do something about cybersecurity um, and the industry and how it's changing. But when I think back to um, my career and what's some of the most impactful and inspirational speakers that I've heard, it's always, I learn from the lessons that others have learned. And so I thought I'd focus my time um, talking about my journey, some of the things that I've learned um, and share that with all of you. Uh, so I wanted to start from the beginning. Um, I grew up here in Cupertino, California in the Bay Area. Um, I was born and raised here. My parents, both my mom and dad are from India. They moved here, uh, they actually met in the US, uh, but both were born and raised in India. And my dad actually had grown up incredibly poor in India. And when it came time, he was a very good student. When it came time for him to go to college, he didn't have the means to do that. Um, he didn't have the money. He didn't have the, the, you know, any of the facilities needed to go to college. And so he actually ended up writing a letter to Indira Gandhi, the prime minister of India at the time and got a, uh, who's sent him, uh, sent her all his report cards, uh, showed his grades um, and said, you know, I'm a very good student. I don't have the means to go to college. And Indira Gandhi had given him a full scholarship to go to college and anything he wanted to do for graduate studies and beyond. I share this story about my father because it explains a lot about my upbringing, which was, education was such an important part of my family. And so just because my dad didn't have the education that he, you know, he wouldn't have had it without this help. He wanted to make sure that my sister, my brother and I had the, all the resources to go get the education that we wanted. So we grew up with all this amazing, you know, all the resources. I had a computer and I had encyclopedia set and everything you'd need to be, uh, have a good education in, uh, in the Bay Area. And so I'm very proud of that. One of the things that we didn't have was, uh, you know, what, one of the things, because they were very traditional and we didn't see a lot of like, you know, we didn't see our parents hug. They didn't really hug us very often, but it was kind of what we were used to as kids and what we were, what we used to see. Again, I share this because um, I want to share kind of my career journey, but there were some really meaningful things that happened throughout my journey that still sit with me today and have made me who I am and have taught me life lessons and career lessons that will sit with me forever. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in the Bay Area. I went to school here. I went to college not too far away, just uh, at UC Davis. So I got my computer science engineering degree from UC Davis. And then I got my first job. I was recruited from Davis to Pacific Gas and Electric, a utility company here in the Bay Area. Um, at the time that I graduated, it was a really bad time in the economy and there weren't that many jobs out there. So 
I went to one of my friends was being recruited from, a, uh, you know, from college at pg and And she asked me, hey, Rinky, free pizza night. Will you join me? And I said, sure, free pizza. As a starving college student, I'd be more than happy to. So I went and I joined her. And one of the hiring managers asked me, Rinky, what's your favorite class? And I said, oh, I'm taking this cryptography class that I sent, I find very fascinating. And they, he said, I have an information protection role open. Would you be interested in interviewing for it? And I said, absolutely. Um, I didn't even know what information protection was, but I was excited that he, I was getting an interview. Um, from there, the rest was history. I interviewed for the role. I ended up getting it. And that was my entrance into cybersecurity. Um, I was working uh, at pg e probably about three months into the role. I got a call from my father while I was working at pg and um, and it was weird to get a call from him during the daytime because he would usually not call me or bother me because they wanted me to work very hard and do well at work. So it was weird when I got the phone call and he just said, Rinky, you have to come home right now. And I said, right now, like in the middle of the day. And I worked about an hour away from where my parents lived. And he said, yes, you need to come home right now. And so I rushed out, I left work and I went home and I drove home and I took the public transportation and then drove my car home from there. I arrive at my street and I see probably about 20 police cars, an ambulance, fire trucks, all parked in front of my house. And I see my mom in front of the house and she's literally crying and screaming and she's pointing at her arm and saying, take the device out of my arm, who planted it there? And that was kind of when my world shifted completely around it was one of the most heartbreaking things at the time. We didn't understand it completely as to what was happening. We found out that, you know, that there was mental illness that ran in my family. My mom was diagnosed with schizophrenia and a few other uh, mental illnesses. And it was a lot to comprehend at the time for me, for my family. Um, and, I, you know, you have a lot of questions that come up in your mind, like, what am I going to tell other people? How are, is anybody going to understand? Am I going to suffer from this? And each of us, my me, my sister, my brother, my father, everybody was going through their emotional journey. And you hear time and time again that mental illness can rip families apart. It can leave people alone. Folks don't understand it. This was such a critical time for me and my family when we saw this happen. And I saw my dad shift from being a just like I said, he wasn't like the huggy, touchy feely kind, but I saw him completely shift and change. And I watched him bring family members together, friends together to make sure that my mom could live a normal life and my mom could be well, and that she could overcome uh, the me mental illness and live as normally and as peacefully as possible. And she did. And she even took care of my uh, daughter when she was a year old and lived normally. But what I learned in that moment was everything about teamwork. It changed my perspective in life. It changed my perspective in my career. I saw how the power of people and people being around you, who you surround yourself by, with, compliment yourself with people with various strengths, ask for help, make sure that there's a whole community of people that are moving you forward and helping you. And this is a lesson that sticks with me today. Um, I'm very passionate. You hear me talking outside of here about mental health as well. It's a really important topic to me. But one of the things that I've seen is when you have, when, you know, even today, even today with COVID and all of these things, people suffer from mental health. And I think it's others around them that carry them forward and help you kind of come out of, uh, out of those situations. And so I think teamwork was such an important lesson for me. And I carried forward um, in every job that I had. So I was at, um, you know, I was at pg e suffered this thing, we got through it. And then um, I was at pg e for a few years. I went from there to walmart.com. I got my master's degree in cybersecurity up while I was at pg e And then I went to walmart.com. I got, I had my um, first security engineering role at walmart.com where I got to do everything in cybersecurity that you can imagine. I also found my passion there. And I also had my first daughter while I was at walmart.com. Um, and from there, I, when I found my passion and I had my daughter, I was like, you know, I need to find something a little bit closer to my house. Now I, the commute is getting really hard. It'd be great if I could find something closer to home and find something that aligns with my passion, which was driving security culture change within companies. I found that being a developer at heart, um, but having now experience in the cybersecurity industry, 
what I was very passionate about was how do you build security into the DNA of a company? How do you change and win the hearts and minds of employees in a company such that security becomes something that they're thinking about, uh, you know, in, in every part of their job? And so I found this perfect role for me at eBay, which was a security culture change role. I took that on. Um, my career grew at, at eBay um, and my boss ended up taking a different role and that position got open. And I it was a chief of staff position for the security organization, which meant leading security strategy, driving security culture change. And it was the first time in my career that I felt you know what, I think I'm going to go for that role. I don't know what it entails, but I'm going to go ask if I can take that on. So I went to the chief information security officer and I asked him at the time that, hey, I would love to take this chief of staff role for the security organization. Um, you know, here are all the things I've done. Here's what I'm, I can do for the organization. And he came back and said, no, Rinky, you're not ready. You're not ready for the role. And I literally wanted to go and hide under a rock. I didn't want to come back to work. I was mortified. I was so embarrassed that I had even asked the question. I was thinking, how do I even look him in the eyes again tomorrow at work? Um, and I think I need to go find a new job. And so that thought process continued in my head for about maybe a week or two. And then I came back and I was like, you know what? He doesn't know. Like, I'm going to get that job. And I came back and I worked my butt off and I showed that, yes, not only can I do that role, but I can do a lot more than that. Um, and about three, three to six months, I think it was about six months after my boss said, Rinky, what do I have to do to keep you? Like, I can't lose you. And I said, I want that chief of staff role. And he said, you got it. And what else do you want? Um, the reason I share this story is Time and time again, it's proven that we, like as we as women, we don't take risks, um, and it's that's a proven data point. And I think risk taking is so important. It's so important to our careers. Every time I've taken a risk, it's been something that's been so positive, and I learned something from it every single time. And a lot of risks you take, as long as they're calculated, they're gonna be. There's gonna be calculated risks you take where. You, you may not actually, it may not pan out well, but I can tell you those moments are the ones that you're going to learn the most and it makes the next risk you take easier and easier and easier. Um, and that feeling that I shared about me wanting to go hide under a rock and not ever come and make eye contact with anyone. Now it's, it doesn't last two weeks. It lasts five seconds. I can brush it off and walk in and be again, right back up again on and taking my next risk. Um, and so I think that's my second lesson that I wanted to share is that risk taking, making mistakes, feeling really confident about taking on something that you might not quite be ready for is the way that you're going to feel that challenge and that just fire in your belly. And so I wanted to share that story. Um, and that was kind of what, where I landed at eBay. So I got that chief of staff role. I did that for a few years, uh, took on more functions at eBay. And I got to a point then um, where I had my second child and I went on maternity leave and I felt that, hey, I kind of need a new change. And I was managing a really large global team and I came out and I said, you know, I think I need to go back to being an individual contributor, being a parent of two kids, plus managing a big team. It was just burning me out. So I went and took on an individual contributor role at Intuit. I was the information security officer for a few of their business units. Um, did that for about three months when they said, Rinky, we're transforming. We're going from packaged software at Intuit to public cloud. We're going to move TurboTax into AWS. Um, that was a game-changing decision in the industry at the time to move such sensitive data into public cloud. And it changed the industry in ways that we now see it manifesting in terms of what you can do in cloud. And so this was, um, for me, I thought, man, I have never led product security before. And to take that on and help them transform into the cloud, that I don't know if I can do it or not, but I was very excited about it. I had that fire in my belly. I took on the role, led product security, built out a global organization with offices in India and Israel and in the US, um, did that for a few years. That led me to Palo Alto Networks. Um, and that was another career shift. I, within cybersecurity, I then took on a security operations role. 
Um, I built the SOC for Palo Alto Networks. When you think about that, Palo Alto Networks is a company that is the leader, leading cybersecurity product company. And I got to build the uh, security operations center for Palo Alto Networks, which is what other companies modeled their security operations centers after. Um, and it was interesting because you don't see very many women leading security operations role. And there was um, a user conference that Palo Alto Networks had, and we had the head, the director of CSI Cyber, the TV show there. And there's a famous actress in that show um, that he has, and she, Patricia Arquette, and she's the woman that's leading all security incidents. And he made a comment of, oh, I'm really sorry for glamorizing the leader of incident response roles. And everybody, all my colleagues looked back at me and I was like, no, no, don't be sorry for glamorizing it because I'm the woman in high heels that runs around and is leading incidents for Palo Alto Networks. Um, so very different role than I had before. Um, I went from there to lead enterprise security at IBM for about a year. And then from IBM, I went to Rubrik to take on my first chief information security officer role. I joined Rubric after um, Rubric had a breach to lead uh, to build out their security program. Um, I was at Rubric for a little about almost two years to lead their security program, build out a global function there, really build robust security for cloud and for what they were doing in the backup recovery space. And then COVID hit, um, and I, I was so excited to take Rubric public and build a security program. And no one could have thought, uh, anticipated the things that happened with us all going shelter in place. And so shelter in place happened. And I'll be honest with you, it gave me a lot more time at home. I was traveling before I was doing all this, um, you know, like work meetings in the office and all that came a little bit to a standstill and it gave me a lot more time. And so I'm, I was in that extra time, I was working out for three hours every day. I was cooking extravagant meals like you wouldn't believe for my family. Um, and I did that for almost, gosh, it was like two months, three months into COVID. And it got really tiring for me really fast. And I sat back and I got a little bit, I went through a little bit of an identity crisis that what, what am I doing? I don't feel like I'm making impact in the world. I don't feel like I'm driving change. I don't feel like I, there's something wrong. And it took me a while to realize that I had lost my passion along the way somewhere when COVID hit and that I didn't, that fire wasn't there. And it took me down a little bit of a spiral and it, it made, it made me realize that I need to find something where I'm driving change. I'm making impact. I need to work for a place where I feel real passion around what I'm doing. And so I started interviewing um, and I started looking for other roles and uh, Twitter came along and said, hey, Rinky, we'd love to talk to you about the CISO role at Twitter. And when I thought about the changes that they were making, how they were impacting the world at that time, some of the values that they really stood behind, decisions they had to make that were so difficult, um, I said I had to do it. And then as I was interviewing, they faced a massive breach. And they asked me, Rinky, do you still want to come in? And I said, 100%. Um, and Again, I shared this story specifically because I think we've all gone through hard times with the shelter in place. We've seen our families and friends go through hard times as well. Through the hard times, the great times, you have to make sure that you're doing what you're super passionate about. Um, and I think that's the one of the most important things because it makes the tough times a little less tough. It makes the great times even better when you find your passion. And I know in cybersecurity, when I started, I did not like my first role. I did not like what I was doing. And I found my passion. And I, again, I lost my passion along the way and went back and I found that passion. And I think that's the most important thing in what you do is to make sure that you're super passionate about it. Um, and so those are my stories. Um, you know, if I could leave everybody with three lessons here, it was one, Teamwork is everything. It's about you and the team and teamwork will carry you through and will take you farther together. Um, risk, take risks, take really big risks, make mistakes, embrace them, learn from them. They're the ones that are gonna carry you very far and find your passion. It's Your passion is everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rinki, for that inspiring talk. It was wonderful to hear your journey from Pacific Gas and Electric all the way to Twitter and all the experiences. I'll, I'll let the participants ask questions. 
Um, if any of you have questions, please type them on the chat. Uh, we have a question. What's the best way to manage your time? Gosh, that's a good one. Um, you know, for me, I, um, I prioritize ruthlessly. So, to, you know, I have two kids at home and people always ask me, Rinky, how do you manage it? How do you manage it? And I feel like every day you have limited amount of time and you have to make decisions around that time. And you're going to prioritize certain things and say, these are the most important things I need to do today. Um, and then you have to feel really good about what you got done. Um, and I think to me, managing your time is all about where you want to put your time, feeling really good about where you're deciding to put your time. Um, you know, I share this a lot about moms feel really guilty. Like I know I did earlier um, and they feel like, oh, if I go and travel for work, I'm not going to be there for my kids. Or if I'm there for my kids, I'm missing out on that work trip. Um, I've done both. I've missed out on my daughter's dance recitals or school performances because I chose to travel and I'm very proud of that decision and where it landed me. And on other hands, I've been at the dance performance or that school speech and I feel very good about being there for my daughter. So um, I don't carry any guilt. I think there's enough people that are gonna try to make you feel guilty about how you use your time. Just feel really good about how you're using your time and make sure you prioritize and you're actually taking the time to plan out what that means. Yeah, well said, Rinky. And especially the part about feeling guilty. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, second question What are the biggest security incidents you've handled as a CISO? Gosh, um, there's been so many. Uh, there's, you know, the most interesting ones to me are like always the insider threat cases. Um, but I've, I've dealt with some of the biggest ones have been nation state attacks that were really crafty, done over many, many years. Um, but some of the most interesting ones were insider threat cases where somebody was actually doing something really bad and you catch them through a nuance, right? Someone, um, I there was an incident that I had to deal with where somebody took terabytes of data over a two, three week period and transferred it into their personal account. Um, and that landed us in starting an investigation under that against that individual that then blew up to, it was one thing after another, after another, that individual was in a country um, where it was hard to take away their laptop and their devices and their other desktop computers they had because uh, that wasn't the culture. And so lots of nuances. And we found out that the incident was much larger and the insider threat case was much bigger than we had originally even anticipated. Um, and I actually had to fly out of the country to deal with that one. And we were also worried that in that country, employees are allowed to bring guns to the office. And so that was another thing we had to think about, okay, how do we do this? What if that individual has a gun in the office? How are we going to deal with the inside entire case? Um, so super interesting insider threat cases, but yeah, that was, uh, that was one of the more interesting ones, not the biggest one. The biggest one was that nation state attack we had to deal with. Thank you, Rinky. Um, the next question, what's the best mindset to have as a woman in tech field when we have so many challenges coming our way? Um, I like this question because we do have challenges, right? Um, and I think what I've learned along the way is that, you know, we're surrounded, um, we're, we are the minority when it comes to tech and specifically cyber. But one thing that I've learned is that people usually have good intent, even, you know, if someone, whether it's someone speaking over you, or it's somebody who doesn't understand your situation, you might be a new mom, you need to take some time off, and you're not able to convey that. What I've learned is when you can educate those around you, that's the power that we bring to the table. Only we know what we're going through. And a lot of times education goes a long way. When someone does speak over you to say that, hey, I have a point to make, and I've been interrupted and I'd like to get my point across or to even go back after a meeting and share with someone that I wasn't able to get my uh, my thoughts across in that meeting because there were too many people talking and I'd love for you to be an advocate for me and for other women to convey our thoughts or whatever it might be. And so I find myself that it's constant education process around you, assume good intent and you know teach when they might not know what they're doing might be causing roadblocks that shouldn't be there. Thank you. Um, the next question, what's your answer to where should an organization start if it does not have any IT SOC? If it doesn't have what? 
and IT sock? Oh, um, I think the best place to start is you start with visibility, right? So if you don't have a sock, you one of the things you want to start doing is start collecting visibility um, and seeing what's in your environment. And once you start doing that, then you can start building, okay, what do we need to monitor for? Because now you start understanding your environment uh, better. And so that I think is the best thing that one can do. And that will start the that will create the use case of why you might need a security operations center, because as you get visibility and as you start writing rules and that starts, uh, you know, firing off alerts, you'll finally be able to go back and see that, hey, this is where we need to go and actually invest in a security operations center. Thank you. Um, any more questions? How do you stay productive while also preventing burnout? Um, I say this to my friends and family members all the time, but, you know, I would go absolutely insane if I didn't exercise. I carve out lots of time in my day to exercise. I spend my morning, I start my morning off by having a like one and a half hour exercise. And then anytime I have a 15 minute break, I go out and get some fresh air. I go for a walk. I do whatever I can. Um, and so my your mental health and your physical health, nobody's gonna care about it except you. you. And when you're mentally and physically healthy, you can be there for everybody else. And so I think the only way you can be productive is if you make time for yourself and that's how you avoid burnout. You have to take the time off. You have to be mentally healthy. You have to be physically healthy and take care of yourself and make sure that if mental health means that you need to go and take a vacation for a few days, you need to make that decision for yourself rather than burning yourself out. Uh, the next question, as a fresher, I want to enter the cybersecurity field. So what are the things that I should be looking for when I'm trying to land my first job? Um, this is what I shared. I think what I've learned in my career is a lot of people go after the big company or they look at salary and they look at, you know, money and all these things are important. Yes, it's nice to work at a big company and it's nice to get paid really well. We all want that. But I think the most important thing, who you're working for, who you're going to be working with. I mentioned earlier that when I was at Walmart, one of my peers, he took me under his wings and he taught me everything. And I still think like, why did he invest in me in that way? But he did. And he showed me everything. And it taught me so much at the time that I couldn't have learned in books and I could not have learned in classes. And it doesn't matter what I was paid or anything else. It was that was the most valuable thing were the people. And it started teaching me that people's everything, your team is everything. And so I think the most important thing to look at is not, not the money, not the company name, not necessarily the title, but do you really like the people that you're gonna be working with? And I think everything else will come in, into place, whether it's in that role or in a future role. Thank you, Rinki. Um... So thank you so much for sharing your personal and professional experiences with us today. Um, you mentioned a very few, a lot of key things actually during your talk, like education, mental illness, physical health actually, family, um, importance of being confident and passionate about what you do. Also um, taking risks is what got you here. Um, and also a few of your oh moments, like the ones uh, about the chief of staff where you mentioned that you wanted to do something and someone said you're not ready and then you came back with a bang you know so those experiences are really um, inspiring for all of us to hear so thank you so much for sharing them with us today um, i think there is also another question that is coming um, after a data breach occurs how should a company handle it like what are the steps yeah i think um when a data breach happens it's first you understand i think one of the things you want to do is quickly understand that what kind of breach is, is it? What kind of data might have been exposed? You want to get all the facts. So I know that you don't want to make any decision until you have most of the facts. The next step is you want to communicate internally to have the right stakeholders, right? Be Make them aware that this is what's going on, that here's the data that we have around the breach. Here's what's happened. Here's our understanding. And here's the impact. And then you should have some, you should have playbooks already set in stone that say if there's a breach, here's kind of how we're going to go and execute beyond that, so that you can be transparent then to your customers or users, uh, and let them know that hey, here's 
what happened. Here's how we're dealing with it. Here's how we're containing it um, and have the right kind of public communications that are needed around the breach. So I think first it's make sure you have all the data, work on containing it, communicate internally and quickly execute on a playbook so that you can externally talk about it in the right way and make sure that you don't lose your users or you don't lose customers because of poorly managed communications be behind the breach. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, what is your thought process about making decisions during tough situations? Like, how do you go about it? Um, you know, I always, when there's a tough situation, I try to dissect it, right? So it's always a tough situation is going to make you feel a certain way, whether it's angry or upset, or it's difficult to solve or whatever that might be. Um, and to me, I always think a tough situation, there's very few tough situations where you have to solve it in the moment. A lot of times you can kind of walk away from it and say, you know what, I'm going to come back and solve this. I think the most important thing is understand, being able to dissect what are the things that make this situation tough and how can you tackle each one of those things to simplify it and then go and tackle each one of those and pull who you need to help you solve those tough situations as well. You don't have to always do it on your own. So, um, you know, the social media companies like Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. So they deal with a lot of data of users, you know, and there, there are leaks that happen quite a lot. Like, how do you think or what, what is, what do you think are the consequences or the damage? Like, how do you damage control it later? And, you know, how do you go about it? Yeah, uh, you know, when breaches happen, it can be hard and, you know, the companies will fa uh, face financial consequences. There's no question about it. I think the bigger thing is, what well, can a company rebound from a breach? And we've seen that companies disappear sometimes because of breaches and sometimes they rebound and they can be even stronger after a breach. Um, and so it all depends on how they handle it, I think, right? And again, it also depends on the financial consequences. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for this. Um, but we've seen that when companies do come back and they do make the proper investments and they come back and they communicate and they're transparent to their customers and they try to really fix the issues, you'll see them come back and come back strong. And in some cases, it can just completely wipe out a company. And this is why I think it's so important for companies to think about security at the design phase, very early in development. And you know, the earlier a, a new company is starting that they bring in security expertise, the better off that they're gonna be, right? And so they've got that thought process. Once you build a company and it's like big, it's very hard at that point, then to go back and fix a lot of the legacy tech issues and tech debt that you've accumulated over time. So I think um, just thinking about what the impact of a breach, we've seen it all over the place. I mean, you as well as I know that the news is all over around this topic. Yeah, uh, I think we can take one last question, which is, um, I know you mentioned about security incidents during your time as a CISO, but what are the, the main challenges that you face as a CISO in your day-to-day life? You know, it's it's what I mentioned as also, you know, being a woman, um, you're, you're, I feel like secure, uh, being a CISO in general is the same thing. I feel like our job is to constantly educate others <laughs> about whether it's educating um, other, your partners in the organization around translating risks to, you know, tr translating, you know, complex issues into business risks that they can understand. And you're educating folks on, hey, here's a risk in your department that you're accepting. Here's what the impact of that might be. And you're constantly teaching people. You're teaching the board and you're teaching the executive team and you're teaching the company. And that's a big part of the CISO role, I would say, that is a constant. And when you talk to other CISOs, you'll hear that too. And some, some people will say that you need CISOs need really good communication or CISOs need to be plugged in with the business. And I think when I boil it all down, it just just comes to one of the things CISOs have to be very good at is constantly educating those around them. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Rinki, for answering all the questions from the participants so patiently. Uh, I'd like to once again thank you so much on behalf of Shakti Khan team, on behalf of Amrita University. And I'd also like to mention uh, one other thing, you know, Rinki, despite her busy schedule, like we were the organizers of Shakti Khan were doing a women only cybersecurity conference at the scale for the first time and we were quite unsure of so many things um, and Rinki was very kind enough to actually uh, come forward and help us 
uh, she even scheduled a meeting with us to explain how we could do some things in certain ways and that was really helpful so um, there's few of few of them in the world like you Rinki uh, who take the time to keep mentoring uh, the, the, the aspirants of the field for example so I'd like to thank you uh, again once again thank you so much Rinki. Thank you so much for having me, Surya, and everyone at ShaktiCon. I appreciate it.